All right, welcome to today's episode. My name is Alex Mason. I'm here with my friend, Becco Jang. So I am from the Stock Stories podcast and Becco is from Value Investing TV. And we're here today again, uh, just like uh, we did in the last episode to talk a little bit about investing. But instead of talking exclusively about you know what our favorite investors and entrepreneurs are or what our first investments were like, we're going to just get into what we love to do best, and that's go through some, some companies and analyze them and share that analysis with you. Think about uh, how, we, how we analyze them. So today we're going to be talking about a home builder, and this is one of America's largest home builders, actually. They go by the name of Lennar Corporation, ticker symbol L-E-N. And so what Becco and I are going to do today is we're just going to go through a little bit about the history and just kind of get acquainted with the company, the basics of it. And then we'll go through the nitty gritty analysis of what we think about it and all of the numbers and things like that. Awesome. So, well, Becco, uh, welcome. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks for the intro, Alex. Excited to be here. And, uh, and for my audience listening to this podcast, Alex, um, you know, um, you know, glad, glad to introduce uh, my audience to Alex. Uh, and uh, yeah, excited to do this. Let's, let's get into it. Yeah, likewise. So I figured we'd start a little bit with just kind of where this company began because every company has a story, right? And the way that that story begins can often inform why it even exists today. And with Lennar, they're actually not that old of a business. They began back in the 1950s, actually, and they were started by a couple of guys, Gene Fisher, Arnold Rosen, and eventually one of the partners left. Another guy named Leonard Miller came into the picture. And so Leonard and Arnold were partners, and that's actually how the business got its name. They combined their two first names to form Len and then R, so that formed Lennar. And they just started building houses out in Miami, out in Florida. And kind of like a lot of home builders, they really honed in on their specific local area for a while. They pretty much built exclusively in Southern Florida for actually decades. And they only expanded nationally to other markets, I think in the 80s and 90s, really. But they kind of follow this natural story of growing a little bit bigger, acquiring other home builders. And the thing that Lennar had going for it was, it seems at least to me, based on studying their history, that they were pretty much just a good standard operator. They didn't do anything too flashy. They didn't do anything super cheap either. They just created these good standard homes for families, people who wanted brand new construction homes. And that was basically their strategy. It seemed like they really only got into acquisitions later once they had more capital, but they IPO'd in the early 70s. And then with that capital they got from the IPO, they started expanding into other markets. But that's that's basically just very quick history in a nutshell. You know, home builder, local, started local in, in South Florida, started building homes. And then one thing that distinguishes them is after the market crash in 2008, they obviously, they faced some hard times just like every other home builder. And around 2010, they invented this program called Everything's Included. So that that paradigm is basically when you buy a Lennar home, everything that you should need or want is in there and you don't need to buy upgrades. It's not like other types of builders where they're nickel and diming you here and there for stainless steel appliances and granite countertops. No, like everything is there. It's rolled into the price. So, so they really marketed that heavily in the early 2010s and actually up through to today, that's still kind of like their main thing. Um, yeah, I definitely yeah. saw that on their 10K as well. They're really sort of heavy on the, the marketing of that in 10K, the fact that they do all included in home building. So I thought that was really notable as well that you point out. Yeah, and, and honestly, Becco, that's the main thing that I noticed as a prospective home buyer, because actually the whole reason that we were talking before this episode and doing some research, the whole reason I came across Lennar in the first place is that my wife and I are thinking of 
building a home eventually, a new one, and moving. And so we looked at some houses a couple months ago and got acquainted with some of the builders. And one of the model homes that we walked into was a Lennar home. And of course, we just started looking around. Seems pretty nice, good floor plans. Of course, it's new, right? So it it looks enticing. (laughs) But that was really the main thing that I noticed about Lennar is the salesperson was stressing to my wife and I that, hey, everything is included. Everything that you see that's in the price. Mm -hmm. Whereas other builders, they didn't really do that. They were like, well, this is our model. You know, it really costs like a hundred thousand more than what we like the standard version. So yeah. So it seems to be their main differentiator. Mm -hmm. Did you check out just out of curiosity, did you check out other home builders while you were down in Houston? Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely checked out a bunch. I think there was Centex, uh, Lennar, of course, DR Horton, Coventry, David Weekly. Uh, we did like a whirlwind tour of a bunch of different neighborhoods yeah. and a bunch of different builders. It's, it's interesting. Uh, Liberty, Liberty Homes was another one. There's so many builders out there, yeah. actually. It's interesting because real estate, you know, by its very nature, is very local. But we're talking about a company that's pretty, you know, pretty national in its presence. And so I think that's that's really a sort of interesting paradigm. And I think I guess what did you what did you feel when you were did you did you feel the same as as how you felt reading the 10k and and, and some of their marketing points? Yeah, I think certain aspects of it were in alignment again like that everything's included mindset comes to mind. Mm-hmm. One thing that was very different looking at the financials and reading more about the investor side of the equation was I didn't realize they were in other types of businesses too, both in the past and currently. So they had this investment financing arm called Rialto, I think it's Rialto Capital Mm -hmm. Management. Mm -hmm. And then they, I don't, I don't think they have that anymore, but currently they are invested in a lot of multifamily residences Mm -hmm. and they're actually a landlord, kind of like a REIT almost. Mm -hmm. And so that was something like I just would never have known or didn't know when I went to look at a Lennar house. Mm-hmm. But as far as the home building side of it, it was it was good. It, it The floor plans that we saw, I would say if I was to list like the top three builders that we were impressed by, they would make the top three, but I wouldn't put them at the top mm-hmm. as far as, you know, like quality of finishes and everything. Mm-hmm. But it does. I, I see the appeal. Um, of why they're as big as they are mm. because it's it's just very they have very clean looking homes mm. and they're not super duper expensive they're kind of what you would expect for a new build i think the average new build lennar sells nationwide right now is around four hundred thousand. but the homes especially down in texas they're even cheaper mm. so you can get a new build for i think there is one for 300 320 thousand so those are those are some observations from actually like checking out the houses. Yeah, I think that's I think that's actually a good segue into actually diving a little bit d- deeper into the company as an investor from an investor standpoint. So, you know, one of the things that uh, we like to do on the podcast is sort of dive into companies specific sort of high level overview of the company. So in terms of you know how they're organized, uh, and um, you know based on their business units, um, what is their sort of strategic vector. Um, you know, what are they really focused on? And then, and then from there, we look at kind of the, you know, what's really important in, in value investing and investing as, as uh, overall, which is to think about their moat. So why don't we go down that sort of route here? And, um, and so, um, so from the, uh, to start off, to start off in terms of the divisions, I saw that they're sort of broken out into different geographies. Uh, as you mentioned, they started off in Miami but they have East, Central, Texas, and West. Um, and in terms of a revenue breakdown, about seven seven billion comes from East, Central about three billion, two point seven, Texas two point five billion, and the West eight billion. And you did mention Alex that uh, some of the revenue comes from non home building, um, but the the breakdown of the revenue is ninety three percent of revenue comes from home building, so it's still a small part of the revenue stream right did you notice that while you're uh, reading through the 10k 
Mm, I, I didn't notice that. I'm glad that you picked up on it and mentioned it. And it's interesting that that's how the numbers show it, because I know in some of the investor presentations and the slides that they put out to investors, they don't really highlight that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they show certain things, but I didn't get the impression reading some of the other materials that the apartment business was a little bit bigger than it was mm -hmm. just because I think that they, I read somewhere that they're the, one of the biggest landlords, like multifamily landlords in the country. But it sounds like because their home building is so big, it's still not even really um, a big factor for them. Yeah. So I think that actually is a good pivot to kind of their strategic vector that they're thinking about strategic pivot. Um, so this is what they wrote. They want to operate uh, in a land light operating model. So you mentioned up at the top of the episode that um, they're almost like a REIT in that they actually buy land and hold land and they build on top of it. Obviously, that comes with a lot of overhead in you know signing the lease, not signing the lease, actually owning the property, not, sign, not signing, owning the property, which comes with a lot of overhead. And on top of that, you have to, you know, basically build out these these homes. So instead of that, instead of having kind of a, I don't want to call it bloat, but in, you know, in some way, a bloat of, of carrying this overhead of actually owning land, they want to pivot away from that into more of a service level uh, kind of company where they just build build homes on top of it. So I think that's the kind of the strategic pivot they want to uh, they want to go down on. Um, and then another thing, another thing that they mentioned is that they really want to focus on multifamily businesses. I think it's pretty clear if you have a multifamily business, multifamily unit, obviously the rent or the, the the price that you can extract out of per square foot is going to be a lot higher, just because you can pack more people into a you know particular area of a particular area. So I think that that makes sense. Some other things that they mentioned in 10K, they're really trying to increase efficiency in building process reduce SGNA, reduce customer acquisition costs. I mean, these are these are kind of like obvious things that you have to do as a good operator, you know, reduce SGNA, obviously, um, reduce customer acquisition cost. Um, but not, nothing really kind of notable, but just um, just directionally, they're going down the right path is the sense that I got from reading that that segment of 10K. Another thing that you mentioned up front is that, you know, um, different types of businesses is under this company company like Lenar. Um, obviously you had you, you we talked about we talked about the, um, the land the land business and then obviously the home building business is a big portion of it. But some of the other ones I just want to highlight for for our listeners is they have title insurance underwriting business. Um, they have real estate brokerage in Florida. Uh, they offer residential mortgage to non Lenar home buyers. Um, what else? Uh, retail title business. So they're in sort of ancillary businesses that surround home building. Um, however, uh, they are actually divesting non-core businesses. Uh, non-core business units, uh, assets are being divested um, and have been divested over the years. Um, uh, so for example, in 2018, they divested Rialto Management Group, the one that you talked about, Alex. So I think they're really they're really trying to focus on the core business and optimize the core business as much as possible by really focusing on multi business units and 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 getting away from land owning sort of the aspect of their business. So I th uh, what do you th what do you think about that, Beko? What what's your take on the strategy? I mean, do you think it's it's wise for them or unwise? I think it's I think it's kind of a natural progression of any corporation, actually. You know. Um, you know the the the, um, the famous professor, the late professor who passed away, um, Clay Christensen, uh, out of Harvard, uh, coined this term um, disruptive innovation. Uh, disruptive innovation. You know, when a company starts, when a company starts out, um, you know, building businesses, they really focus on underserved or unserved customer segment, and they try to serve that se segment by you know basically going down market. But as soon as you know company have sort of found the the product market fit what they tend to do is they tend to become from a from a product building business to margin optimizing business you know this is sort of the transition that a lot of company go companies go through right 
they really focus on you know businesses and then creating new products doing new things and then at some point the company becomes too calcified and too old that their innovation engine is sort of stuck that they're not creating new things and doing any any new things anymore at that point in time what do companies do they really focus at that point on margin improvements you know just squeezing out the last mile um, of, of whatever engine that they had right so i think it's a natural progression for any companies to go through Lenar, I think, is going through the same transition where they are, um, you know, it's, it's a mature business. So, you know, what, what, what can an, a manager, an operator do at this point? I think what they can do is really kind of, um, you know, think about how to, how to you know, manage their margins uh, better and, and squeeze out what they can. Otherwise, I think they would have to sort of continue, continues to invest in, more of a more of a disruptive kind of innovation, but it, it's very inherently because of the system that is set up. It, it, it's just is very inherent. It, it's very difficult to do that for big businesses. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a cool theory. Um, I hadn't heard that progression before. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 interesting because I'm wondering if you know I, I don't know about you, Becca, but sometimes when I read all these 10Ks of all these businesses and just thinking, okay, management is basically just selling me on whatever they're doing. And it seems like they kind of, there's, there's like, either we're expanding and we got to acquire and we got to do all, you know, get in all these businesses, or we need to slim down. We need to be asset light. You know, like you said, Lenar management's indicated that they want to be land light. And I get that, but it, I'm just unsure of, what's really the best best strategy because a lot of times management teams they'll say one thing they'll do a strategy for several years and then they'll completely reverse mm -hmm. and i wonder if that's necessarily predicated on market shifts that they need to adapt in that particular way or if they just feel like they need to do something different mm. yeah i think i think probably the answer is somewhere in the middle right or or both um but one of the things that Clay Christensen always talks about, had always talked about, um, is that these big companies, if they want, if, when they want to, and and they all do, like there's good managers, they're not inherently like dumb people who are running these companies. There are smart people who are running these companies. But the problem is when you are running these giant corporations, you, you have incumbents, you have incumbent customers that you need to serve. And that makes up bulk of your revenue so it's going to be very difficult for you to focus on something that is that is going to return revenue in the future. And it can be 10 years, 20 years down the future. These are bets that you have to make. But if you are stuck serving your customers that is generating 10, 20 billion dollars of revenue right now for you, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to to, you know, to invest a portion of your time into thinking about something that's, you know, 10, 20 years out and risky, too, for your, you know, for your career sake. Right. And so um, that's that's what he talks about. And I think that's that's reflected in a lot of the business strategies that I that I see, you know, across across the board, not just Lenar or home building business, like you mentioned. Right. A lot of the companies are in the business of margin optimization. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, that's why I think companies like Amazon, for example, has done tremendously well because they, they know they knew this uh, from the start. They knew this from the get go that. They needed to invest in products and service lines that is that is going to pay dividend, you know, 10, 20 years down the road. Um, so that, that's, you know, that's that, I think that's what makes extremely, extremely talented operator like that. that can really see far into the future and is able to take that risk versus ones that they cannot. Mm. Well said. Yeah. So is Lennar an extremely talented operator? Is the question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we can find the answer getting into some other aspects of the business. Yeah. And I think also just to give, um, you know, um, just to give a little bit more uh, fair, nuanced perspective on this is, is too that home building, like how much innovation can there actually be? That's another kind of more fundamental question about the industry as a whole. Like how much how much innovation can there be? I, I mean, there are startups right now in Silicon Valley and elsewhere that are trying to disrupt home building uh, in, in some ways, right? For example, you know, there's like this tiny home or tiny house movement where you can just buy, you know, basically small houses and stack them on top of each other to make it a little bit more efficient. There are things like that. 
Um, but that's, I think, you know, how much disruption can that actually do in the mainstream sort of home building ecosystem? Probably not that much, probably very marginal is, is my guess. Uh, and so I think there is some of that sort of inherent um, opportunity limitations on how much you can actually innovate in a particular industry. I think that that also depends on yeah particular industry. So uh, yeah, mm. yeah. I think I think you're right, Becco, because the things that I've seen out of Lennar studying them aren't that impressive from innovation perspective. They're more like tweaking. It seems like. To me, they're tweaking at the margins in order to make customers happy. Yeah, existing customers. So, for for example, now they're including Amazon Alexas with all their homes. Yeah, they're including Ring doorbell systems with all their new homes. You know, these are all nice little things. <laughs> putting a bell on it, put or <laughs> putting a putting a bow on it at closing, it makes people feel good. But to your point, Becco, yeah, at the end of the day, they're they're building a house. Yeah, and they're using the best materials they can at the best prices. Yeah. Exactly. No. But, you know, I, I also want to point this out, too. It doesn't mean that they're actually bad investment, too. So I think that's where I think we could go down um, in our further inquiry into this company. Uh, yeah, let's get it. So I think um, moving on to the next question, I think um, one of the things that we want to you know unearth and um, illuminate is their competitive advantage. And so I want to ask you, as a recent home buyer, or perhaps you already bought a home, but uh, at least you're in the market. You are in the market, or you are in, still in the market. Um, still in the market. Still in the market. Okay. No contracts been signed. Okay, still in the market. <laughs> still in the market. Uh, what What do you think their um, their main competitive advantage is? Mm. How are they different than Dr. Horton or some of the some of the companies that you mentioned at the top of the episode? Yeah, I got the impression. When I went into the homes, talked to some of the salespeople, looked at their brochures and their website, I got the impression that the overall experience was going to be moderately easy. Mm. That's the word that comes to mind is easy mm. because, for example, I know they're, they're divesting a lot of their subsidiaries, but the fact that 80% of their customers who get a mortgage with them go with Lennar Mortgage that tells you something. Um, other things like the everything's included whole slogan that they, they push really hard, uh, that that's attractive to someone like me. I don't necessarily want to spend weeks and weeks going back and forth with a builder about this particular type of hardware on my cabinets in the kitchen. Like, I don't know, just just put it on there, make it look nice. I don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. my wife might have something different to say about that. But you know, from a lot of home buyers' perspectives, we want easy. Yeah. We want something that we can just okay, this looks perfect. It's in the area we want. It costs this much. Let's just buy it. Yeah. And I think that's might be a slight edge that Lennar has going for it because some of the other builders that we looked at, it. It didn't seem like that. They really, it seems like a builder either pushes like price really hard or they price customization really hard. Mm. Like some of the higher end luxury builders, like, oh, you can customize everything with us. Or they push that value convenience aspect. And I I feel like Lennar's in that camp. Mm. Like, hey, this is a really nice home. It's a good price. Everything's included. You can do your mortgage, your title, insurance, all that with us. We'll take care of it. Don't worry. Just come on down and, and let us show you around. That's the kind of vibe that I got. Mm, I see. So it sounds like we're really they're really indexing on the in the convenience, 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 and and and, and good value, right? One stop shop sort of way. And so if I could sort of kind of turn that into investor speak, is that they have because of the kind of the um, the customer service, the products that they offer, there is there is maybe not a strong brand recognition, but there is at least some brand recognition that Lennar, if you if you go to them, it's going to be very easy, and that's why people come to Lennar. There's sort of this brand associated with Lennar that draws people in. Would that be a fair characteris- characterization? I think that's fair. To a degree. And as an investor, I would look at it and say, okay, I think 
they have somewhat of a brand presence in certain markets that where they're really strong, particularly in the Southeast, mm. it seems like, because that's where their roots are. But I don't, I don't think their brand is substantially strong mm. compared to a lot of the other builders. Mm. At least I don't, I don't really get that impression just because as you mentioned in, I think earlier conversation, the home market, the home building market is really fragmented, even with all these big players. And so I know certain neighborhoods that I've gone into to look at builders. There's there are several builders. There's Chessmar, there's Lennar, there's DR Horton, there's Liberty, there's Centex, there's all these all these different builders. And as from the consumer's perspective, mm. it's kind of like, well, I don't really know unless I've had a prior experience mm. personally, or I've heard through word of mouth through a friend about, oh, we had this excellent builder. And I think that's kind of the hard part to differentiate. So from, again, switching back to the investor side, yes, I think that there's some brand recognition. I just don't know if it's that strong. Mm. I think that's, I think that's a, I think that's a good summary of, of, of that. One thing that I, so switching gears and looking at other competitive advantage, um, I don't think it's certainly like, it's not like the lowest cost provider. So people are not going to Lennar just, just because it's like super cheap. I don't think that's, that's it. So we can kind of rule that out. I don't think there's any network effect that classically defines like social media companies. I think, so I think we can rule that one out as well. Um, a switching cost. Mm, maybe, uh, I don't think so. You know, like it, it, it's sort of like a, you know, when we think about switching costs, I think you think about banks primarily, right. Or like, into it, TurboTax. You have all your information in there. It's very painful to migrate a lot of that information to another system. Uh, but I think I think this one perhaps could be one uh, intangible assets uh, and, and others. And what I mean by that is one of the things that they pointed out in 10K, and I think this is actually quite relevant now because of the commodity prices um, and labor. So because of their size, they can negotiate larger contracts with subcontractors and um i don't want to i don't want to use this word hoard but they can kind of have a bigger say uh in the labor market because they can demand look you know our customer base is large so if you want to work with us work with us uh and you need to show up by this time they can demand to have a lot more leverage because of their size um, and therefore they can drive down the cost for subcontractors and making the home a little bit more affordable and reliable, uh, in, and in times like this, for example, where the commodity prices are, um, you know, are, are going up. So maybe there's some of that intangible asset, sort of um, the economy economies of scale that comes with this company. At the same time, there are other big companies also, like we, like we talked about, um, uh, Dr. Horton, uh, Liberty. Uh, Toll Brothers, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure how much it actually affords them competitive advantage, um, but it's certainly something to point out. I do think that ultimately, as we're talking through this, I think I think that ultimately, I'm, I'm not sure, but this is a hypothesis. Um, maybe, maybe like this is really a summation of all these competitive advantage that we talked about, but very local. It's like hyper-local competitive advantage. I don't know, like if, if that if yeah. that makes any sense. Yeah, I you know what I think that's true, and I'm glad you brought that up because it it makes sense with the whole industry, right? Real estate has always been local by its very nature, and so if I think about a subdivision in a suburb in Houston, Texas, that subdivision is its own little mini ecosystem where you have customers, the people coming in, they want to live there. They like that there's a grocery store nearby, a good school, et cetera. And then you have the, the companies, the businesses who are selling the plots of land, the builders who are actually building on those plots of land. And then of course, you know, the developers and there's this whole little ecosystem just in that one subdivision. And depending on how savvy Lennar's management is at getting, say, prime real estate for locations to build, or like you said, negotiating those prices of their labor or raw materials. Those are all factors in the equation 
of how well this particular house stands out in this particular location. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really sure how to, how to judge that. It seems like they are really strong in certain areas of the country. I do kind of applaud management in a sense because I noticed that their acquisition flow and their expansion was actually kind of slower than I expected. I, I really expected them to acquire, acquire, acquire within the first 20, 30 years of their business's life, but they didn't do that. They opened up shop in the 50s, didn't even expand out of Florida until I think 71 or 72. So that tells me that at least back then, and I'm not sure if it's true or not now, but at least back then, management seemed pretty disciplined about not having this huge like empire building strategy that we see with a lot of companies these days that, you know, they get big and then they get, they get a little crazy with how they want to expand. They just want to keep expanding at the expense of the customer that at the expense of their margins, their costs, they start making poor decisions managerially. So that's one thing I noticed is it's just like the absence of super quick growth actually was attracted to me mm. when I was reading up on the history of this. Mm. Interesting. I think, that actually leads to uh, nicely to my next question, which is, in terms of um, let's think let's think about the long term prospects for and runway for growth. Um, I think this is more of a question about the industry as a whole and sort of a macro take on the home building industry. And so, just a quick search: um, short term housing started to surge, nineteen point four percent to a seasonally adjusted annual rate of. 1.7, uh, 1. 1. 1. 1.7 million units last month. All that to say housing sort of construction boom is is happening right now. There's a lot of houses are being built and a lot of, a lot of people are buying houses, um, at least in the short term. How do you assess the company's long-term prospects, uh, Alex? There's maybe a couple ways to think about it. I think the first way that I think about it is from bottom up approach. What, what can we see in the numbers income statement balance sheet that's telling us how this company might fare financially in the future. So that's one angle. And then the other angle is the top down demographic viewpoint. And I think I get the sense from management in looking at some of their materials that they kind of look at it from that ladder half more so, or at least to a significant degree, because I saw one chart in one of their, uh, I think it was their Q1 presentation to investors, and they showed this chart. It looked like a roller coaster. It, it's like a bar graph that kind of rides up, has a hump, and then goes down, and then it rides up again into this steep curve. And the x-axis of this graph is time, the years, and then the y-axis represents the population of the United States, specifically within the age 35 to age 44 demographic. Mm. So what is what are they trying to communicate? They're trying to communicate that over the long term, more and more people are going to be in quote unquote home buying age in this country than, they, than there are now. And as a result, demand for their products is theoretically going to keep increasing and they can keep profiting more and more. Mm. So that's, that's a sense that I got from, from management, mm. but to expand on that a little bit more, I, I'm trying to connect the dots and maybe you can help me with this Becco, because I see where they're going with the fact that demand theoretically should increase, but we also know that the entire home building industry is not just based on demographic trends. It's based on credit trends. It's based on how willing banks are willing to lend. That's the entire reason the system crashed over a decade ago. So I, I don't know if they're factoring in those risks into the projections, so to speak, but the sense that I got was management was saying, look, you know, we're, we're basically good. A lot of people are gonna be wanting to buy homes in the future just based on the amount of people and their ages statistically. So people are gonna have to buy buy homes. Mm. Well, maybe not. Maybe they're going to buy a resale home. Maybe they're going to rent. And 
I get the sense that from their actions of expanding a little bit into multifamily, like we talked about earlier, it seems like that's kind of hedging their bets a little bit almost with the home building business, which they traditionally have only operated in that business. They're saying, okay, we're still betting really big on home building, but just in case we're a little bit wrong, we want to be one of the biggest multifamily landlords in the country too, hmm. because then we're we're getting money from both sides, both from the renting perspective and from the building and buying perspective. Hmm. So what do you think about that? I think you I think you bring up a really good point, which is that the housing market is completely tied to the interest rate. I mean, 100 percent. Right. I and mean, there is no escaping that fact. And this is, you know, obviously I'm not an economist, so take this with a huge grain of salt. But I think that interest rate is going to remain low for a very, very long time. I mean, Jerome Powell and everywhere, I mean, central banks around the world have sort of signaled that the interest rate is going to be low. And that's why, you know, um, there's a lot of debate about, you know, how to measure inflation. What is inflation, real inflation right now? Uh, asset prices are completely being inflated. Um because of because of the devaluation of the currency by printing of, of more money and the, and the and basically a loss of time value of money because interest rate is going to negative in some countries and have been negative for quite a while which is kind of crazy to to think about and i think that this is just my take i think that is going to be it, it is going to remain low for a long time just because of the debt load and, and people talk about long term debt cycles right I think the debt load that that individual households, debt load on corporations, and now debt load on on, on on countries, you know, sovereign debt, is at a level that is is kind of insurmountable, I think. At, you know, compared to sort of the growth rate that that we um, that we can achieve now, which means that the only way to actually get out of this is to inflate away and devalue the debt. I, th I think that's that's actually going to happen. I think that's where things are headed. So if you devalue your currency um, and, and devalue your way out of debt, um, anyway, all, all that to say that I think the interest rate is going to remain low for a while. That's going to be a boon for, um, you know, for home building business. And I think... Uh, you know, we should definitely touch on this point, which is COVID. I think COVID. Um, so I live in I live in uh, San Francisco, and um, during last year and even still this year, so we're recording um, on the twenty seventh of April. Uh, a lot of a lot of people left San Francisco. They don't want to pay you know three thousand, four thousand dollar for a you know one bedroom apartment in San Francisco, a tiny little shoebox. They don't want to live here, and so I think there's a lot of demand. To build houses, in, you know, in a nice suburb, you know, next, you know, right next to a, next to a lake or something. I don't know. And so I think I think that trend will continue for a little while. Um, and with especially with a digital economy, people can work anywhere. I think that's going to continue. Um, yeah. So I think I think I think both those things both those things I think spell a um, you know boon year for 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 a few years to come. I think for Lennar and other home building um, businesses. Yeah, I think I agree with you, at least in the short and maybe even medium term, that that is definitely going to happen just because of, yeah, COVID really, it just accelerated that policy in the US of interest rates being super low and remaining super low. And as a result, home prices go up, home builders make more money, banks are willing to lend that money to home buyers and the cycle continues and to me that's that's really the biggest risk of this business to me becco is is simply the fact that it squarely exists in a very cyclical industry and earnings have been going up and up and up in this particular industry and I, I do like like you said. I agree. I think it's going to continue in the short, medium term. I just wonder about the long term too, especially given some of the trends of things like their revenue. Their revenue growth has been slowing down. Mm -hmm. uh, things things within their financial statements that seem to indicate to me that 
okay, things are going really well. This is a company with a really big market share already. But do they really have the competitive advantage? Kind of coming back to that concept. Do they really have the competitive advantage to withstand the storm when the storm comes relative to their peers mm-hmm. in industry? Yeah, I think that's a I think that's an excellent segue to perhaps next episode. But just to tee it up uh, for us, what really takes out companies is their debt, right? If they don't have the if they don't if they don't have to service or debt or their obligation isn't isn't due for a long time or or simply they don't have debt to worry about they're not going to get wiped out what what really wipes out companies is the debt i think that's really the, the crux of the problem so um you know we we definitely need to do a deeper dive into their financials to understand where where they stand on that front and also like you talked about the revenue growth and then uh and then ultimately free cash flow and their valuation so Excited to get into it in the next in the next episode. Definitely, yeah. I think there's a lot to talk about there, so I'm excited. Awesome. Do you want to close us out, Alex? Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of both Value Investing TV and the Stock Stories Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us for this awesome conversation, co-hosted episode between Becco and I, and yeah, learning a little bit about the home building industry with us looking at Lennar. And again, that's ticker symbol L-E-N. And make sure you come back with the next episode because we're going to be digging a little bit deeper into Lennar, looking at some of the financials and just sharing our thoughts about the business from an investor's perspective. So be sure to tune in next time for that conversation. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you.